Now, episode three of Dan in his van. I'm going to talk today about DEP gigs. Just a bit of safety first. These are the keys that run the van because it would be dangerous and illegal to do this while driving. So I'm sat still. Now, DEP gigs, what are they? Well, it's basically where you fill in for somebody on a gig and you deputize, which is the full word of DEP. Now, it's simple enough. You get a phone call saying somebody has dropped out at the last minute. Can you do it? To which your answer really invariably should be yes. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Now, when you get that phone call, it may be two hours notice, like I had on Saturday. It was fine, absolutely fine. Usually, if it's at very short notice, they will say what the fee is because they need to get somebody. They need to say, right, the money is X. Now, you should decide on your fee. Um, when you get a phone call and it's a debt gig, you, should, you need to have a minimum amount that you'll go out for. And of course, it depends where it is as well. Usually, if it's a debt gig, it will probably be local uh, because somebody said, oh, I know someone who lives in X who could do that. So very often it'll be reasonably close by. Now, when you're deciding the fee, you should not compare it to perhaps a gig that you lost on the night that you went out as a dep. And actually that happened to me on Saturday, uh, the Saturday just gone. I had one gig booked in that was then canceled. Another gig came in a possibility and that didn't come off either. So I thought, oh, okay. And I went on to Dep Musicians UK on Facebook, put it on my own time. I said, oh, I've had a couple of cancellations. Anybody need, um, you know, an instrumentalist this weekend. And I got a phone call about five minutes later. So actually, just that little on Facebook gave me some income. So great. <clears throat> now, once you're happy with the arrangement, you know, as I said, you should say yes to a gig you're offered and that you have half a chance of doing. Note the half a chance. You know, if it's tunes you need to learn, learn them or just have a, a little, just make a few notes. Um, if it's a, a genre you don't usually do or really want to do, still say yes and do a little bit of background research on the, the genre that you're that you're doing um, you will come away from that depth gig a much better musician and with some money so there's there's not really a downside yet well in fact there isn't one at all um, so as as I say with the musical benefits when you go to a depth gig and you don't know half the tunes or you you know it's a busker um, you, it's just the concentration of playing alongside other people, some of whom you may never have met. I knew the drummer the other night and the alto sax player, but the rest of the band I didn't know at all. So you're meeting new people. Um, you're having to therefore to look round for cues and, you know, the ends of songs or maybe songs that are different to how you usually play them. Uh, it might be a chorus and then it goes back into a midsection. You just need to be right on the ball with it. And then there's, of course, there's the etiquette of depth gigs. You know, it's fair enough if you're with a band, you can be familiar with them. You know, you turn up with a bit of a joke and you da 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 and that's fine. But when you go to a depth gig, if you've not met any of the other players before, there needs to be a sort of balance of the sort of pushiness versus the sort of being overly familiar. Um, obviously, politeness is all important because people notice those sort of things. Now, there are musicians out there, many musicians out there, who will play me into a cocked hat, and that's fine. But bands are more likely to return to go back to a particular debt player if they've if it's been a really easy gig if it's been really nice to play with them or there's been just a just a general air of oh yeah this is all right isn't it you know that's much better than somebody who turns up who's a bit frosty but maybe a better player so um it's important to prove yourself as a musician before your personality so when you go, if you, I was on bass the other night, and I just thought, well, I've just, I've just got to do my thing. I've just got to get through, and make sure that I can play all these tunes correctly. And actually, I didn't have the set list beforehand. Uh, the drummer said, "Oh, it's all right. You'll be fine." And I thought, okay. 
and as it was, I knew maybe 60% of the tunes. So the other 40%, I had, I, I sort of maybe heard them on the radio, or heard records once, and I thought, oh yeah, I sort of know this. So, yeah, musicians who think in terms of just doing the job and being sort of gracious and nice to the other people in the band, regardless of how they are to you. Um, I've had this before, I'm a debt player, and the person who booked the gig has... Yeah, the the bass player has has booked the debt without telling the lead singer or whatever, and you get there and there's this sort of slightly frosty reception. You've just got to get through that, you know, um, and say, "Oh, it's okay, be absolutely fine," because it will, you know. Um, politics and you know the band politics and, and music they never ever mix. They, it's never a good thing with that because it goes against the grain of what music is, which is communication and just total understanding and and mutual respect now with equipment if you're booked you know on a particular instrument you should take the best stuff out with you don't just go oh that would be all right I'll just take the little amp or I'll just take the ideally take a couple of things and turn up absolutely prepared um, if you have a reel of mic cables or any spare mics just take them you never know what's going to happen when you get there. The singer might go, oh no, I've left my mic. And you say, oh, that's right, I've got a spare. Or I've actually, um, I mean, I know I've fixed stuff anyway. My degree is in electronic engineering. But I fixed um, a guitar amp for somebody at a gig. And it was kind of last minute. And I went, sorry, I've got tools in the van. And fixed the amp, which hadn't really worked properly for years. But this guitarist kept taking it out and you know, just making do. And since then, I got eight, nine function gigs out of it. So that's what, um, about £4,000 worth of work. Just because, you know, I did a reasonable job on that day of the dep playing, but I also, I took tools with me and I thought, well, I'm, you know, you're waiting to play. This amp doesn't work. Say, so, right, let's, let's get the top off this amp and have a look at it and try and fix it. And I fixed it. It was quite a simple fault, actually. But, you know, the difference it made to that guitarist and the difference it made to their perception of me that made a big difference. So do all this, regardless of the fee. You know, if it's, I don't know, a local gig and it's £70 or something and you think, well, it's just about worth doing. Yeah, you'd be out until, you know, 1am or something. Do the whole mic cable, spare this, spare that, regardless of the fee, because you don't know who you're going to meet there. It could be somebody who's just doing a local gig, but is in fact, you know, doing better or sort of, you know, better paid gigs elsewhere. And then you can get on their radar. If you do, if you want to take business cards with you, then do, you know, absolutely do. But hand them out at the end of the gig, not before. You know, if it's a, oh, yeah, see again, oh, here's my card, you know, as a parting shot. It just makes a better impact than if you hand your card out before the gig starts. Because actually, really, your playing and your attitude uh, overall during that depth gig will rub off more on the uh, other players than a business card will. The business card is simply a call to action. It's a phone number. You can friend request the other band members on the Facebook, you know, when you get home. Of course you can do that. You know, nobody really, nobody ever refuses. And I've done that a few times. You just friend request. Even if it's a gig you didn't really feel you wanted to do or you think, oh, well, you know. Friend request them because then they can see what you're up to and see your gigs. Um, see any links that you've got on YouTube, for example. Um, and it's just it, a friend of a friend of theirs might need a player. Oh, yeah, I know this guy. He did the job for me. It's just networking and being on people's radar. And you never know when you may need gigs to fill sort of fallow periods. You know, the, those sort of, well, we call it freelancers January, where after Christmas and the cruel tax bill is due at the end of January... I always save up for it. I'm a, you know, I don't do things last minute like that. But you need to make sure that you can cover fallow periods. So, for example, if it seems relentless in December, 
with gigs around Christmas time, just be very, very grateful for those. Because January, you know, there's bits and pieces. You know, February and you're thinking, uh, I need some gigs. Whereas if you've done as much as you can in December, yeah, lots of debt gigs, put yourself out as a debt player. It's they are my favourite gigs, I must say. They are the favourite ones. I do bands and I love that and it's great fun. But when you're a debt player, you've got this this air of you don't know what to expect at all. It makes you concentrate and actually when you're driving home kind of holding the steering wheel with your eyes wide open because you've just had such a it's been a sort of this adrenaline rush and actually doing a depth gig you know it makes it makes it easier to get home <laughs> you don't have to stop at every motorway services to have a 10 minute nap or whatever so i've had also um you know don't worry about um january being a fallow period because that's when you do your admin you do your promo and you do your phoning around and you do your, you know, what's coming up for the year ahead. So I've had gigs that are coming uh, in August that were booked in January. I just phone around, you know, hotels or places that have wedding receptions. And then lo and behold, March comes and you get a call from somebody who says, oh, we're looking for a band. We're getting married at X. And stuff, if you if you're proactive like that, stuff always comes in. Now, I've had, you know, I've had a, couple, a few periods in my working life where, the, you know, gigs have been really thin on the ground. And my, you know, I, I sympathise with anybody else who's in the same situation because it can seem like you've been forgotten. But actually, you know, you speak to other musicians and they say, oh, yeah, it's been a bit quiet for us, too. That's fine. It's, it's what it is. It's how we it's how we operate. So DEP gigs are a really good way of not only increasing your musicianship and your skills and your communication skills, but they're also great fun.